Hi. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining. I know it's late in the afternoon, so I really appreciate that you guys are showing up for us uh, to take you through Azure Data Services running with Postgres SQL. Okay, there are going to be references to MariahDB and MySQL in this as well. That is because that we run it on a common um, service fabric. So there, there, there is a lot of interchangeability with regards to that. So just don't get confused. And that's a Postgres conference. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're basically just going to run through what it is, how to deploy, um, run through some new features, including um, the new query insights, um, and just a bit of the architecture there as well as show you how to do some auto-scaling, et cetera, and then talk about ATP, which is advanced threat protection. I heard there was a, quite a, a speech on yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah, with Jacques, my colleague. <laughs> okay, great. Is the sound okay? Okay, cool, fantastic. Okay, guys, so this is basically what we're going to be running through. So as I said, we're going to be looking at how to, do, how to operate OSS databases in Azure, particularly PostgreSQL. We've got to do deep dives regarding availability, the performance, monitoring, tuning, and security. Um, we're not going to talk about the custom experience using Azure Postgres uh, SQL with Adobe. Um, if you'd like, we can cover that off of the actual um, um, session, um, because otherwise we will actually run out, run out of time. Um, then we're also going to look at migrating your data with data migration services, um, which is a nice slick way of keep keeping your system uptime, you know, um, really, really close to, to the four nines, and then being able to switch over instead of having to use, you know, the, the good old PG dump methods, etc. Okay, cool. So, a lot of people ask questions. Well, these are the common questions that are asked by your admin, by your operations teams, by your DBAs and developers. Okay, so you can see there. We go, how do we manage um, the hardware purchasing and management? How do we get TCO, how do we get RR out, out, of, our, out of our tin whilst also leveraging, you know, well, keeping it cost effective, if I could put it that way. Big one is how do we protect our data? And also, how do we make sure the database is always, always available? How do we cater for the DR scenarios, et cetera? And then upgrades, patches, security management. So obviously, with the Azure platform and with it providing you a platform as a service, you are basically getting that all prepackaged. So we just cover those so you can just see exactly you know, what the benefits um, of that are. Have you guys worked with um, Azure Postgres before? Or are you familiar with the Azure pla data, pl um, data platforms? Or Azure in particular? Two, whopping two, three. Okay, fantastic. That's more than I thought would happen. So that's a good start. Have you guys also registered for Cloud Society so that you can also learn about you know, our products, our features, et cetera, and get free training? It's also a good thing to do. You can speak to your reads at the back for that. Okay, so our numbers are rapidly increasing for the, the uptake of open source databases on the Azure platform. It's, the numbers speak for themselves. We're running in 35 regions. We're having 12% customer month-on-month -month growth, and we have over 26,000 companies running the three engines. Those three engines being Mariah, MySQL, and Postgres, okay? So really, really great adoption there. So if we look at it from an all-up perspective, what we've done is we only use managed community engines, okay? So that, that means when we, we develop the actual product, what we deploy is all the community engines. So that gives you flexibility for integration, as well as for the openness, okay? Because we are trying to be truly open in that regard. So we aren't locking anything down. Community kernels, everything. That's what you're getting when we actually run that. We are securing compliant. That one's quite a biggie. So if you have an on-premise database or an on-premise um, data, data access layer or layers, et cetera, you, if you're in the FSRs, you have to be exposed to BCB, B, BCBS 239 compliancy. If you're in the healthcare, you have to be exposed to HIPAA compliancy. We have this all built in. So when you deploy, you don't have to now go and worry about being compliant. You are automatically compliant, which is really a great thing. So that's, that's a good reason to, to move. If you're experiencing um, issues with um, regu regulatory or compliance, that's a big factor. Um, also, from the, the developer productivity, we are integrated with all of your um, local um, OSS ecosystems, as well as some of our other Azure um, features. 
which is the web, web services, our cognitive services functions, which can easily now deploy, as well as your visualization tools like Power BI. So these are all natively built in, and they're first-class citizens within this environment. So these are the key topics. We, we spoke about them really quickly, but it all boils down to these four key things. So that is availability and performance, security and compliance, manageability, and Azure integration. So we're just going to just take a deep dive into each of these. So with regards to any, uh, not just PostgreSQL, but any of our platform as a service database offerings give you five, uh, four nines availability. That's something that's almost unheard of, okay? So with regards to that, you can literally scale on demand and also, you can also scale your storage separately without impacting your actual system. Plus, we also provide underlying geo-redundancy geo and multi-region redundancy automatically. So you don't have to go and build clusters. You don't have to worry about that, that feature. Unless you, well, you do. <laughs> if you configure it to be locally redundant, you are going to have only local three-copy local redundancy. However, if you do the geo-redundancy, you're going to have that um, fault tolerance across your domains. Um, so there, there are caveats, if you, if you don't do it, you can get burnt. Um, but other than that, you're going to get your four nines, which is really great. And the reason that we can do this and we scale is that we've dis we've, our compute is actually seg segregated from our storage access layer. Um, one of the, be the better things that's coming is what we call Project Socrates, which we've just now previewed. It's now running on C SQL Server for PaaS, but it's going to be coming to the open source community. And that is basically a hyperscale storage subsystem, which can go up to 100 terabyte, but that we've certified at the moment. But theoretically, it has no um, upper limit, which means you're going to have access to really fast storage access layer that can go up to terabytes. And this is done instantaneously with the way we've architected it. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, it was announced at our Ignite sessions. So if you want to go look for it, you can just go and Google hyperscale, and you can go look deep dive into what it, what it actually does. Okay, so built-in high availability. So you, you get your three copies, as I said before, as well as you get compute redundancy. So remember, I said it's segregated, so it's quite easy for us to give you that high availability, high availability for the sole reason that it is segregated. The storage access layer has three, three um, replicas, and the, the compute layer can then just move to wherever because it works off microservices. So we just spin it up. It literally takes between one and 30 seconds for that actual image to um, come back up and reattach itself to the storage access layer. Okay. Okay, elastic scaling. Elastic scaling allows you to basically work with the smallest amount of resources. If you are in a cloud operating model, you need to work within the economies of that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in the cloud. You would still be on premise. Okay? So what that means is you would like to always really run a lean environment, and then only as you need, when you have those spikes, be able to scale that up, use whatever compute you need, and then reduce those um, compute nodes, if we can call it that way, because that's what underlying it is. But we work on a vCore model. As, and as well as a memory model. So what you do is you literally issue, which I will show you um, just now, you can do it via the, the Azure CLI command line interface, or you can do it through the actual um, Azure portal to scale that up instantaneously. This doesn't affect your operational um, systems while it's doing that. You can still have, even if it's an OLTP environment, you will see a little blip but you're not going to have any um, issues with any downtime as you scale that up or scale that down. You can't scale storage, okay? You can scale storage up, can't st scale storage down if you're using that space. So it makes sense, right? Okay, but you can um, reduce the memory footprint and the compute footprint. So this is just a nice little visual of what it does. What I've shown you here is what I'm going to show you here is just the cloud e economics model of what this would look like if you were doing it as infrastructure as a service, which would mean this would really be your comparison between if this was a on-premise sized machine or infrastructure as a service. So in order for you to have high availability in, in the cloud or on-premise, you would require a minimum of two 
servers, right? Okay, so here we've got four vCPUs, we've got 16 gig of RAM, 32 gig of local SSDs, and we're sitting there in order to achieve that um, high availability, $285 a month, right? Now, for high availability with the same specifications in a platform as a service, it's $262. So you can see there is a cost difference. You aggregate that over time, plus also the scale up and scale, do scale down methodology, as well as the complexity of time, so the resources, right? Your IT admins, your DBAs, the infrastructure costs of maintaining those clusters, configuring them. Those are resource costs that you're going to have to put into play. Those guys can now focus on research and development. They can focus on betterment of the environment rather than business as usual. Okay? So it does make sense. So even though it looks like a tiny little bit of cost difference, it actually is even greater than that. Cool. So this just comes down to our performance tiers. This really just talks to how you can scale up or scale down your environment, the implications of it, the cost of it, okay? So currently, we're limited to four terabytes within the Postgres database, per database within a, the platform as a service. But as I said, with the advent of hyperscale coming in, that's going to go up to 100 terabytes and further. And that is, it's already in private preview, which means it's around the corner, okay? So you can literally have really, really large-scale environments running um, on the Azure platform and running at, so your memory optimized um, service tier, you see there can run up to 6,000 IOPS. Okay, that, that's a limitation we put in because we only give you the max IOPS of up to two terabytes, not the four terabytes. So what we do is we do a calculation and for every gig of storage you get, you get three IOPS. So you can do a calculation to see how you, where you're going with that. Okay, so, but we stop it at two terabytes. With hyperscale, that will be taken away. It's still a really, really lot, okay? Any questions yet before I carry on? You guys are just deers in the headlights. Hey? Yeah. You're talking about the data center. Data center's coming in December. It's a de this December. This December, and it's a definite. Okay. Join the private preview, preview and the DC insiders, and you'll get updates as to when they, that comes out. But yeah, it, we don't, we don't, we're not formally announcing it, but the definitive month is December. Under NDA, we can't tell you the actual date. Okay. So when we talk availability zones, we, you get local and you get geo-redundancy. So, Within a data center, you get fault domains. You get three fault domains within a local data center, and then you get your three replicas. If you do geo, that will span fault domains plus geographies. No, that's just a configuration. You can do that now, right? But yes, you, you'll be able to have resiliency, geo redundancy here in South Africa between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Okay, or you can have it between any of the other um, clouds that are not um, government clouds. Okay, cool. Like the questions, thanks. Okay, so we, back to the performance tiers. You can start with basic. Basic is really there for your light compute. Okay, so that's where you should actually be starting your workloads. So um, as we go further down, we're going to talk about the query store that we've added in with Intelligent Insights. I know there was a, a lot, of, I think uh, earlier this morning, there was um, a nice performance tuning session. I, I didn't want to miss it, but I unfortunately did. But um, he would have spoken about the PG stats, DMVs, how to monitor these type of things. What we've done with the Intelligent Insights is we've now integrated that with AR, and we then do um, auto-indexing. We provide recommendations with those query stores, and you allow you to query it as well. Okay, I, I will show you that. Um, but anyway, you should be using that kind of stuff in order to understand your workloads, and then you can build your scripts so that when you, achieve, when you see the, that you're, um, you're reaching certain thresholds, you would then execute these, you would then scale, scale up to whatever tier. If you, one, one consideration, if you do span tiers, there will be a bit of downtime, okay? Because it literally has to move it onto a different type of system, um, subsystem, okay? 
But if you're doing your increase in between the same tier, you'll see here you've got your journal, which has got 2 to um, 32, 64 coming soon. This is instantaneous. You cross, there is going to be downtime. Makes sense. Okay. So we spoke about security and compliance. So I spoke about HIPAA, PC, uh, PCR, BCBS, SOX. We compliant. We also compliant with all the government standards. So um, for the we got, for the government cloud, the, the FBI and the CIA and all of that also have their own different standards that we have to um, basically um, adhere to. We, we adhere to all of those. And as I said, that really does help you go a long way in knowing that you've locked down your environment. One of the key things here, though, is that you have built-in encryption for your data, and back your backups at motion and at rest are auto-encrypted, and that, we use AES-256 encryption for that. Okay, so you, you're getting best-of-breed, enterprise-grade quality encryption and services for your applications in the cloud. Great. So this is a nice one, but it's also a bone of contention for some people. Some people say the cloud is taking away my job. I don't know, I've heard people say that. So the, the, the real way to look at it is no, we're giving you the opportunity to do R&D to further, further and better the system. So, I mean, don't take me wrong, but if you're a DBA who's just doing backups, then you shouldn't be doing that job. You know, you should be, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, you know, we should be leaving this to the system. Okay, and you should be focusing on the performance tuning, the betterment of the system, etc. So yeah, I spoke about intelligent performance tuning. There's advanced monitoring and alerting, which can now integrate with um, blobs, with um, ISVs, and uh, with Power BI, etc. And with any other modern application because of the REST APIs that are exposed. So speaking on backup and restore, you can choose LRS or GRS, which is what I spoke about earlier with you, which is locally redundant and geo-redundant. Okay, built to, the backups are built in. You don't do anything except move your retention period, as you can see, between 17 and 35 days. Um, Long-term backup storage, we haven't done yet within um, the OSS environment. We are doing it in the SQL environment, but I'm sure it will be coming there. I don't see anyone that would be restoring a database older than a month with an operational environment. You, you generally would only be restoring data that's past that if you're looking at some type of auditing requirement where you need to look at a long-term point in time snap of transactions, etc. So for, op for operational environments, this is really um, all you need. Okay. It's as simple as that, right? Click restore, restore to your point in time, and it will allow you to do that. And that's autonomous. Okay. So we've, we've built in the monitoring and alerting. The monitoring and alerting comes from the underlying subsystem as well as from the actual stats within Postgres, the Postgres DMVs, um, and you can customize them. These are the thresholds I was talking about. So you can create auto notifications, configurable alerts. That's where you need to actually trigger an event to do some type of scale or scale down. So there we go. So I've set it up, but uh, I haven't had a chance to um, load the system, so I haven't got any alerts to show you guys. Um, but this is what you'll get. I'll show you how, how to set up the ATP, set up the notifications, and you'll, this is the type of message that will come through to you, as well as you can trigger a rule. Okay. So this is, a, this is the really slick stuff, okay? the intelligent security and performance, that's the ATP mixed with the query store, um, and as well as the AR-backed AR uh, methodology. The, the interesting with the AR is we don't actually just use your system. So what we do is we obviously anonymize all the data, it's all anonymous, but we take the data from all of the database systems in the PaaS environment, and we look at the heuristics of it. We look at different baselines, we look at outliers, exceptions, and what we do is we'll take all of that data and we'll apply that knowledge that we've got from all those systems to how your sh system should be um, working, which is really, really great. You can see them. I will show you, but I think I've got one bar. Okay, I, I, I set up the database this morning. Okay, and then we've got Azure integration. I don't know how many of you guys are developers. Are, are we, is this room more? One, two, yeah, okay, developers, there we go. 
Okay, awesome. So you'll appreciate that you can use container services, you can apply cognitive services, you can use also your own um, OSS environments, you can use Go, you can use Ruby, you can connect, it's, it's, it is Postgres, right? You can, you can also, um, it's got all the features, it's got Toast in it for, for memory optimizations, whatever you want, all of it's there, plus you can still now also natively integrate with uh, the, the Azure environment. I don't want to say Windows, because it's Azure, Azure's not Windows. Okay, but you can build some really, really cool, cool solutions. At the end of the slides, there's um, a deck which has a hyperlink to show you how to actually build out full solutions with custom ARM te templates to build out intelligent applications, to build um, content management solutions with uh, a few clicks of the button. So I'll show you that to give you the links and you guys can actually go and check it out. Really cool. Okay, so... Finally, we're going to have our two over here, okay, December. Yeah? You don't believe me, hey? <laughs> I'll take your number so that in December when it comes, I can phone you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in summary, what we were saying in the beginning of this, um, this is what we used to work for, this is what we had to um, recognize, and that was disaster recovery. It was compliance, it was upgrades, it was management. This is all catered for very, very easily within the PaaS environments of um, PostgreSQL. Okay. So that really should be a big, <laughs> big up for you guys. Um, you'll see when we connect to the system, there's, there's an Azure underscore sys and an Azure underscore maintenance database. Um, those are the databases we use to actually take care of um, your systems. Okay. So these are the common workload patterns. These are also the templates that we've built that you can go and, go and um, look at in the, in the hyperlinks um, later on and see what they're all about. So we've got a CMS application solution, we have scalable web and mobile applications, and we have intelligent a um, analytics apps. So I implore you to go and do that. But the reason we did that is because they are also the most common workload patterns we've seen within these environments as use cases. Right? Okay, so this just takes a quick look at the performance tiers again, but what, what I've changed here is we're looking at the use case, right, rather than what the tier provides, okay? So if we look at the memory optimized environment, that's caching more data, right, and it's there more for your OLTP type environments. We don't use in-memory structures generally for DW workloads or OLAP workloads, okay? There you apply more your column store type of technologies um, and would use your compression technologies in order to achieve better query performance, okay? So general purpose allows you to go a lot higher, it goes to 64 cores, but you're using remote SSD storage, whereas memory optimi optimized does provide um, actual attached SSD. So it's a bit of a trade-off. You could use the memory optimized performance tier, but not use the caching so that you can get the benefits of the higher throughput um, to disk, right? So there we go. So that's a mistake. There's remote and attached. Sorry about that. Okay. So speaking to supported versions, this is an important one. So we support 9.5, 9.6, and 10. Okay. Let's quickly just show you some elastic scale. So it's very simply. I have a Postgres database over here. If you see on your left, this is your ribbon that allows you to basically control the environment. Okay? On your right will be the estate where you can drill down and look at whatever that context has given you. Okay? So for, for scaling, you would go to pricing tier. So this is, this is the portal. I'll show you the CLR as well. Someone's phoning me, so it's disconnected my internet. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so here you can see it's really easy to start scaling. And as you can see, as you're doing that, your IOPS also increase. 
you'll see that. So going to a max of 6,000. You'll see once it reaches 2 terabyte, it there starts dropping. You see, so the IOPS are limited to that 2 terabytes. So just bear that in mind and be cognizant about that. And here you can, we can move up the V cores. Okay? So, so I'm going to go to 16, and I'm going to go to 2 terabyte. It's as simple as that. You press OK. Your system will still be transactionally consistent during this time period. And you'll see here there's the scale process that is running. We can connect to the database via PG Admin. That wasn't supposed to happen. There we go. Yes, yes. Great. So that's not supposed to happen, right? Let's see if it's still scaling. Because the proof was for me to actually show you that that wasn't going to happen. Or what could have happened, actually, you know what it is? It's my client IP. So because I've stopped the connections, and I reconnected when I came to the conference, what would have happened is my IP would have changed. So you see my previous IP was that. We can see my new IP is different. OK, that was it. Cool. I've put in two, but it's fine. OK, so just speaking on the security front, you, ke you can see we, there, there's different, different levels of security that you can add. So I'm jumping because we have. But you can add, you've got your firewall rules, which are by default uh, closed. There's no any, any rules available. You have to provide end-to-end uh, -end rules. That then runs off of uh, TLS as well as AES2. Uh, sorry, it's, it's always TLS. Um, it's TLS2. Um, as well as that, you can create VNet rules down here. So, what VNets are virtual networks. So, because we're just connecting from public IP to public IP, we're creating a, a direct site to site connection, but you can add v, VNets, virtual networks, a virtual net peering, so that you can actually create an ecosystem which spans your local network, and that would be for your corporate environments. Okay, so now that that is added, did I save it? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. That's ridiculous. Okay. Okay, we're going to have to s maneuver, guys. I didn't think it would take that long. Okay. Okay, it's just connecting. Why is it failing? Demo gods. Come on. Okay. I'll fix that at the end and we can just run because we so it is it is already elastic scaling, as we saw. Okay, let me just quickly show you the end result while that's busy happening. Okay, oh, it's because it didn't update the connection settings for the firewall. Okay, so that's still running, so it's taking quite a while. Okay, I did upgrade it to quite a large size. My bad. Um, but at the end, we'll see that it has scaled. Um, let's move along. Yep. Yes, yes, but it was trying to do that and it couldn't, so yeah, that's why some have a little apoplexy, yeah, right, cool. Okay, so we've gone through that, so let's get to the sexy stuff, right? So 
this is what I was going to go through here was just the best practices for the met metrics with regards to um, your Azure Postgres services. So what, what we recommend and what is our best practices is that you always check that your database has at least five gig, okay, or that um, or the, or five percent of because what happens is it actually goes into a read-only state there, thereafter because it can't be transactionally trans consistent with the actual logs, okay? Which means you're going to read only, you go offline. So that is, that's not, re not really a good idea. Um, I'll show you in the Azure CLI quickly, at, quickly if, when we've got like one or two minutes um, as to, um, on how to do that. This talks to the, the linear scale of the IOPS. You'll see there's three IOPS per, per gig and the IOPS don't scale beyond the two terabyte. So with regards to your CPU and your memory, <coughs> you, can use the, um, you can use the query store to, to monitor and check your CPU percentage. Obviously, when you get it to, to, to your top percentiles, you can also then scale those via the ARM templates. And your network latency, what we do recommend is that you should check from an external VM or from your site, do a select one okay, and see that you get a two millisecond latency. I know that might not be achievable in South Africa yet, but when we get our DCs, I think that definitely will be, especially if you're using an MPLS network or you have an um, express route, which allows you to get um, directly into the actual Azure, Azure data center backbones. Okay, so this was the custom metrics I, I was referring to. So we, you are actually now able to plug, plug in to um, the um, REST APIs pull custom metrics that you define, and then you can put those either to event hubs, OMS log analytics, or storage account where you can then trudge through that data and use it for um, either performance analytics or to do some type of action thereafter. Okay, server logs, I'm not gonna go through. I'm literally halfway through my presentation. Um, so this, this really just talks about the query store. So you, your PG underscore stat DMVs, you have a plethora of them which you then actually have to configure. I know you can get a lot of scripts which you can auto deploy to do that because it's quite mature. But if you are just a developer or you don't know the intricacies of the actual um, SQL internals of Postgres, it can be quite, quite difficult. So we introduced the query store. So what the query store does is it collects execution statistics, but it collects aggregates of it so that it doesn't actually affect the performance of your system. Um, there, there are a few parameters you have to set uh, when doing so. I'll show you those now. Um, as well as the fact that it, the query store database sits within the Azure underscore um, sys um, database. It doesn't sit within the, your, your, your database that you deployed, okay? You can, you can query that, visualize that as well. Um, we have seen sometimes, though, turning it on, and some, sometimes people won't use, they can use a top or all. If they use an all, it can cause performance issues, especially in a highly transactional system. So sometimes it may be better to turn it off. Th this would be a test, test case where you'd actually have to test those workloads and see, is that causing the problem? Luckily, the query store will tell you it's causing a problem. Okay, because you'll be able to see the system metadata queries going through and you'll see that those are your, your top weight guys. Okay, so I know I'm running fast, but uh, that 10 minutes uh, did kind of frazzle me. Okay, so we, when we talk about intelligent performance, this just runs you through the steps of what we actually do. Uh, didn't, okay, so my whole stepping didn't work. So there's a step one to step four. But what, what happens is, we analyze the query store for, for um, workload optimizations. What we then do is we then go and look at the hypothetical in indexes, uh, or sorry, statistics within the system, and we see whether we should create an index or drop an index, or whether even adding another index is gonna cause better reads. And if it does cause better reads, it then goes to the next step and says, how, how much percentile of the better reads Will it call, will, will be of, of a better ratio versus the right overhead of having the index. So it does all of these things for you and then applies it or gives you the recommendation. Thanks, Nicola. Okay. Business continuity, backup and restores, I'm gonna skip past. And here we can talk about the current security challenge. So, <laughs> I know it's a, it's, it's a bone of contention, but the biggest one is 81% of of all attacks are done by stolen and weak passwords. And 
the other big one, not sh well, it doesn't really kind of show here, but privilege misuse. So privilege, privilege misuse and stolen week park, park, uh, passwords kind of go together because nearly 80% of all t hacks are internal. So they don't come from the external. Those are people that have either infiltrated, people that have um, um, connections with um, other organizations. I don't know if you heard of the new Chinese, the, the, the China debacle where they put the chips on the super micro motherboards that was recently released. Huge, huge problem. The, the, they, they outsourced their um, um, mother, motherboard chip processor um, to factories in China to get um, assembled, and they actually literally put on another chip so they could do backdoor um, um, attacks onto the network, um, which is really, really hectic. So it affected all supermicro. It's one of the biggest motherboard manufacturers. Really? We, re we released an official statement saying it doesn't impact us based on our checks, and that's because we don't use supermicro, so I don't know how sure it is. But it's a, good, it's a good way to just think of what I'm trying to say based on that tax, right? But I do think it is real. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a doomsday person. Okay, so what I was referring to earlier with regards to the actual um, VNets and the security, this is where we go through. So a connection is never directly... Um, uh, a connection is never direct, directed directly to a database instant. It must pass through the Azure Edge network protection. So when you create that database, it's always locked down. Okay? You have to then create firewall rules and or use multi-factor authentication or Azure Active Directory authentication on top of that. So you've got three layers. Plus, we also added on advanced threat protection where we do anomaly detection of different IPs. So if you've got certain IP ranges that are always connecting to your database, we'll see, based on an anomaly, that this is outside of that range. And once we see that, we'll alert you and we will deny that. We also do den um, denial of service uh, detection, as, okay? as well as data encryption. I told you it's AES256. This is how a VNet endpoint looks like, okay? just so that you guys can get an idea of how you would architect um, your Azure databases. So you would have multi-tenanted multi um, platform as a service environment share. You'll have your ACLs. You'll also have IP ACLs. You'll then also have a customer VNet, and you'll have your on-premise environment. Your on-premise environment can either come through a gateway or via an MPLS network, which is also secured via AES, as well as your, your client-side on-premise firewall with those specific IP ranges. You would then go into your customer VNet, which, is, which belongs to these guys, and you would then segregate these VNets based on application, based on web, based on the data access layer, and then you'll do VNet pairing between those. Okay, so extremely secure. This is just the life cycle of, of how we look at, at, at how you should protect your VNet. So we do the discover, discover, protect, detect, okay? And that just really takes you through the life cycle. You guys can read that. This is really cool, and this is what we do with ATP. So we actively looking for people trying to breach your databases, okay? We look for unfamiliar source locations, as I said, brute force attacks, suspicious users, SQL injection, also cross-site scripting, all sorts of things. And then we'll provide that to you. Okay, so as you said there, just turn it on. It really, really is as easy as that. Guys, I'm just going to quickly switch because we had one minute. And you'll see there, okay, it has scaled. That's great. Okay. Let's just see how long it took. Okay. This. Yeah, it will. And then you will go and have to add it. Just it blocked me. Yeah. to look at the ranges. So it, it, it uses the algorithm to see. So it, based on these, it will know it's coming from a public IP, from an ISP, because I'm using 3G. If you had v, VNet, VNet peering, or you had a range of ACLs, it will alert outside of those ACLs. So here you can see for advanced threat protection to turn it on and off is as easy as this. Okay, that's really as easy to add that. 
And I just wanted to show you that you can also use the Azure CLI, okay, which is basically Bash. So this command here allows you to increase V cores. It's not GA yet. Let me actually just show you. So this is this would be more beneficial. So what I'm going to show you here is via the CLI. Okay. You'll see how we use the command AZ. You see they had already executed. It provides it to you in a JSON file, JSON format, should I say. And what it's doing now is providing me the average CPU consumption. So you can output this data and then use that to determine when to scale. Okay. Which is really, really easy. So AZ Monitor metrics, you provide the resource, which is your subscription, and you then specify the resource group and that server name with CPU percent and an interval. The other option, which is extremely sim similar, is you see the metric storage used, which will provide you with the same information. You can use these two in conjunction in order to, to determine how you can auto-scale the environment. And that will show you storage use, which is coming up with that 1.4, which I scaled to. Cool. Guys, thanks so much. Um, there is quite a lot more I wanted to show. Uh, so if you have any other questions, please come to me afterwards. I'll gladly um, show you stuff or put you in the right direction. Thanks so much for your time.